wrestling cards are gonna pop and when is it when you know and i still think they will what's up wrestling fans trading card collectors welcome to another episode of wrestling with cards today my special guest is bo thompson bo is the guy that's in charge of the one million cubs project that you guys may have seen floating around twitter he's that diehard cubs fan that's his only pc and he's trying to get to 1 million Cubs cards. But we don't just talk baseball cards, because you guys know I really don't collect baseball. He produces a lot of good content over on his YouTube channel, and he's talked a little bit about wrestling. So I wanted to get his opinion on wrestling cards. I wanted to get his opinion on eBay, because you guys know how I feel about eBay and how people make excuses about why they can't start or that the fees are too high. So we talk all about a lot of that and content creation, um, just collecting in general. And I think this is going to be a really good lesson for you guys because as of the time of we recorded this show, Bo was officially selling cards on eBay full-time for a living. And no, he's not slinging the Patrick Mahomes and the 82 Wrestling All-Stars Hogan cards. He's doing kind of like what I do, but at a bigger scale, and that's just working the low dollar, you know, 25 cent cards, one dollar, five dollar cards. So I hope you guys enjoy this show and I just want to really encourage you guys. I know most of you are here watching because you like wrestling cards. That's why I started this channel. But if you kind of go outside of the bubble, there is a lot of great content out there that is talking about sports cards and collectibles. And a lot of that you can take and apply it to wrestling cards. It's really been a huge benefit to me to listen to people talk about soccer, listen to people talk about baseball, listen to people talk about F1 and the types of cards people are buying the way that people are thinking when they're collecting or flipping some of these things that are not wrestling products. And then, like I said, that's helped me kind of come back to wrestling and say, okay, how can I apply this to what I do? So like I said, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And you know, after this video, if you guys enjoy it, make sure to follow Bo on Twitter, One Million Cubs Project. Links will be in the show notes. And make sure to send him some Cubs cards. We gotta get him to one million. Before we jump into the interview though, just a few quick reminders how you can help continue to show your support for my content. Easiest thing you can do, and it's free, hit that subscribe button, give me a like, share this with a friend, share this with someone in the wrestling community, share this with someone in the hobby. It's real easy, just copy the link from the video, send it to him in a text message, an email. Let's just spread the word about content creation. Speaking of content creation, this isn't necessarily a way you can help support me, but if you're out there and you are interested in producing content, whether that's for wrestling cards, wrestling magazines, maybe a specific set of wrestling cards, maybe you just want to continually go deep into your PC and talk about why you collect, we need more wrestling card content creators out there. So if you're seeing this, spread the word to that, hit record, you just got to start. Some other ways you can help support the show though, check out the podcast, Worlds Collide with Tony Vela my wrestling with cards podcast audio companion to these videos links below in the show notes to some different ways you can help support my spotify all my social platform links are down there you can join the wrestling with cards patreon community where you can contribute as little as one dollar a month to help show your support towards my content and you can go higher than that of course different tiers in patreon and you can get different perks and bonuses based on that helping steer the direction of the content a lot of the times depending on the tier but again, links to that in the show notes. You can buy me a coffee down there. Believe it or not, I was in a little bit of a hurry to record this today. I've had some coffee, but I don't have it with me, so I can't do my gimmick. I just continue to thank you guys for watching these videos, listening to the podcast, showing your support. But let's stop and show our support to Bo Thompson from the One Million Cubs Project. Bo from the One Million Cubs Project. On the show today, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me on. Yep, I've been following your projects for a while now, but then you started doing content. You started talking a little bit of wrestling, which we're going to get into, and the eBay journey. So there's a lot of fun stuff to talk about. For anybody that's just mainly into wrestling cards, uh, just give a brief introduction of yourself and what you've been up to. Sure. Um, my name is is Bo. One Million Cubs Project is, is just kind of a, a collection of mine. Uh, collecting a million Chicago Cubs baseball cards. Um, Cubs are obviously my favorite baseball team. Um, been collecting Cubs cards since, you know, the late 80s. Um, but uh, I started the project in, in 2017. Uh, I had a, acquired just, just buying off Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace, you know, big collections. A lot of it's the, the 80s and 90s stuff that's not really worth that much. Um, and decided that 
if I had a million cards total, um, a lot of it's the, the eighties and nineties stuff. I'm not going to be able to sell it. I don't want to throw it away so I can trade it. And I'll, I'll look for trade partners that want eighties and nineties, Red Sox, Yankees, White Sox, and, and they can trade me their eighties and nineties Cubs cards. And it just kind of, kind of blew up from there. And uh, initially it was, it was, I was all, I was almost begging to, to find trade partners. And now it's to the point where uh, I've got to turn people down almost <laughs> daily uh, because I just have too much going on, too much coming in. So uh, that's that's my background with the the project, the One Million Cubs project. What's the current count, if you know right offhand? Uh, I'm right around seven hundred and fourteen thousand. Getting closer. That's uh, <laughs> when did you actually like uh, make a concerted effort to go for the one million? Like at what what year did you start that? December of 2017 is, is when I, uh, you know, it all kind of came to fruition and, and it was probably the, the week of Christmas, I think is when I launched my, my Twitter account, uh, started the website, um, 1 million cubs.com. And, and that's kind of where it all began. So it was the very end of, of 2017 and, and hit 2018 full speed ahead. So most people are probably wondering why would you want to go for a million cards? Why not go for the card that's worth a million dollars? So it's a different aspect that I really appreciate of a, you know, a PC. So what made you decide to just start down this road? And are you, uh, this is kind of a few questions bundled into one. Are you just collecting as many? So you don't care about duplicates. You don't care about condition. You just want as many as you can. And well, like where, I guess, where was your mindset when starting that? Because for a lot of people that are watching this that maybe aren't collecting anything but wrestling cards, they've got a, a favorite wrestler from the 80s or the 90s, whatever their era is, and it's not quite the Hogan or the Flair from the value perspective. So maybe they feel a little bit weird about collecting that specific thing. So where's your mentality when you dove into this to decide this is my PC? Well, I'm a quantity guy, <laughs> as, as you can expect. Um, and I, I think the difference between there's so the, the, the wrestling card world, it's so limited. Um, sure. there, there's not too many products out there for wrestling cards. And especially when you go back, I mean, you go back prior to the, you know, prior to the nineties, you know, once you get back to the eighties and seventies and, you know, there's really, um, it's really narrow. Um, so there's not much quantity out there. So, um, uh, my mentality is, you know, baseball cards the, the Cubs date back to the 1800s. Um, so there's some tobacco cards as early as 1887. Um, and of course there's, you know, hundreds of, of products that, that come out all the time. So there's, and I, it's hard for me to put a uh, pinpoint, a favorite card or one favorite player. Um, so I have one favorite team and, and they have a lot of, of baseball cards. There's probably somewhere in the vicinity of 220 to 250,000 unique Cubs cards. So there is a lot of duplication um, in the project. And, um, you know, the, the kind of genesis of, of collecting 1 million Cubs was I had a million cards total. Um, so that was kind of where that number came from. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a fun milestone. It's, it's attainable. Um, although it's, you know, it's going to take time and, and, and money to, to get sure. there, but, um, but it's, uh, it's an attainable number and it, you know, tied into, you know, I'll just dump my million cards, uh, that I don't want for, uh, for a million Cubs cards that I do want. Do you think it's a fun chase because it's, not all about the value. It's not about flipping. It's not about selling. It's like just acquiring these cards that nobody wants. I'm actually kind of taking a page from your book and I'm not going to say I, I set the bar to a million because I didn't. I was just like, I'm going to try to get as many Buffalo Bills cards as I can from the junk wax era or high-end autographs. Just like whatever it is, I'm going to take it. And it's been fun for me to buy out collections and as I'm sorting through stuff, oh, there's Bill's cards. Okay, you know, just throw it in. It's not like I'm going out of my way to spend a ton of money on that. Are you kind of seeing the same thing with accumulating these cards? Absolutely. And, and I think one of the the funnest parts of this is, you know, I'll do a lot of, of you know, sometimes I, I, I do bulk buys where um, somebody has 40,000 um, Cubs cards and, and so I pay X amount. So, and I'll dig through and I'll find cards that even from the, you know, what we call the junk wax era, the, the late 80s, early 90s, even though I find uh, 
cards from those years that I've never seen before. And it's like, you know, some of the oddball, the food release issues. Um, so I can get excited over, you know, a Sean Dunstan card where, um, you know, the, the person who sent it to me, you know, it was just, it's just a, a random card and I, I don't care about it, but I do. And it, it brings me joy and, you know, kind of on the, on the same when I, you know, turn around and, and trade and, you know, I'm just throwing some random cards in a, in a trade box and, and they're super excited to receive something that I thought was, you know, well, that's just, just another random card, but you know, they love it. So that's, that's kind of the cool part is, is coming across these cards and, and, you know, it's not a, it's not about the, how much a card is worth. It's just, you know, the, the joy that it brings in, in, in the hobby. Yeah. That's kind of where I've gone with trying to accumulate all the bills. Cause that's like the only team that I've stuck with from when I was a kid. Uh, I remember I specifically decided to pick them because when they were playing the Cowboys, the Super Bowl, I was like, um, I don't want anything to do with these guys. Everyone, all my friends like them. I'm going the other way. And then, you know, it's, it's been, it's been a nightmare. Some, except for this year, looking good this year, but that's just the fun thing that kind of it's nostalgia, um, you know, rebooting player collections from when I was a kid, that's a fun thing. A lot of it stuff's cheaper. So uh, whenever you, I saw and started researching what you're doing with this project, I was like, like lockstep with you. I was like, man, I totally understand this, but I don't, I don't think a lot of other people do in the hobby as you know, ever, everybody sees the dollar signs and the headlines and they think that's what it is, but there's a lot of fun to be had otherwise. And speaking of that, where are you at with wrestling cards? Uh, you're, I, I watch your content and you talk a little bit about wrestling cards. Um, let's, let's just open the Pandora's box on wrestling cards. So, you know, here's the thing. I I've been a, I've been a, a pro wrestling fan since, you know, since the eighties, um, you know, a little Hulk and maniac and, I bought the 1990, uh, there was the classic, classic. Um, and I remember buying, I think they were 99 cent, the blister packs. Um, and I remember, you know, Coco Beware and, and the Brooklyn Brawler and, and some of these, you know, off the wall characters. And, and I loved those cards that set. Um, and even though I was a huge card collector, I never really caught the bug for wrestling cards at that point in time. And I think part of that is because there wasn't, there was that release and then there were, some other releases in the early nineties, but they weren't as common. You, you know, you go to Walmart, you go to Kmart in the early nineties and there wasn't really, you know, too many wrestling products out there. So it just wasn't really top of mind. I really got into wrestling magazines in the mid nineties uh, when I kind of, kind of returned to, to wrestling in, in 95. Um, so I was, I was big into wrestling magazines and then I actually got back into wrestling magazines uh, during COVID um, you know, and I mean, I've always been in, in collecting cards and, um, a lot of people return to the hobby collecting cards. They went to their basements and closets and attics and brought out their old cards. Well, I revisited my wrestling magazines and That's I was cool. looking on eBay for, you know, I loved pro wrestling illustrated and yep. I, I have a subscription now to PWI and love the PWI 500 and started buying some back issues and, you know, trying to, to collect the run of, of those. And then I found some, uh, some lots of like sixties magazines and seventies and, you know, some of the stuff that I didn't really watch too much of. And, you know, just in listening to wrestling podcasts, I've, you know, heard about some of these matches and mm -hmm. some of these wrestlers, but didn't know too much. Um, but on the card front, um, I really love WWE heritage. Um, because it's, you know, it, it's a throwback to baseball, um, the baseball sure. designs. Um, and I know the the new product that's uh, coming out for the first time in three years this year mm -hmm. uh, with the 90 tops baseball design. So I'm looking forward to that release. Um, you know, I remember having the action packed um, from the, like the mid nineties. Um, and, and one thing, the, the, the biggest wrestling regret I have is I gave away like my wrestling magazine collection from the mid nineties and I had a WWF magazine subscription right when they, their whole run of those perforated cards. Oh, the cards. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, you know, and I gave those to, I had a coworker, you know, in college and she had a son that was big into wrestling and it's like, I, I don't want these. So, you know, hundred, 200 magazines, all those old WWF magazines. So that was my wrestling regret is, is dumping those off and, you know, because some of those, some of those early rock and Triple H cards are, are yeah. you know, worth some decent coin. 
yeah i actually just recently saw i'll have I, by the time this comes out i will have already had the video out but um they had a, a psa 10 actually of the triple h perforated card and i was like how do you get a psa 10 on a perforated card but it, it looked it looked tremendous but wow. um are, is there anything you're actually collecting card wise or are you mainly um kind of in it because maybe you're getting them in collections to resell which we'll touch on that in a little bit um as far as wrestling cards yeah um, in wrestling cards, I, I don't collect the only collect, the only thing I like truly collect and hold is, is my Cubs cards and, and Cubs memorabilia, uh, for the wrestling. I just, I enjoy opening the box, you know, opening got, the yeah. cards, seeing the card, you know, I, I enjoy that. And then I'll put them on, you know, put them on eBay. Um, but there's nothing I, I actively collect. I, I actually, I kind of stopped my run of, of collecting the wrestling magazines because it was going to be kind of my hobby away from my hobby of baseball cards because I, you know, during the, the winter months, I'm in Wisconsin. So it gets cold oh, yeah. and during COVID you can't do anything. And, and with winter, um, you're not going to, going to be outside. So I needed a, a hobby away from my baseball card hobby. And, uh, so I, I picked wrestling magazines and then all of a sudden my, my eBay store and eBay sales picked up. So, you know, that's when I had to, uh, um, you know, kind of step away from the, collecting the wrestling magazines and, you know, kind of focus on the cards. Makes sense. Um, are you planning to keep the magazines, what you do have? I know you said you slowed down. Are you planning on keeping those or is that something you're also going to plan to move? I've, I've got, I have some listed on in my eBay store and then I'll, I'll probably be listing more. Um, you know, it's in, in, in probably in 10 years, I'll probably kick myself for, <laughs> you know, some of the stuff that I have and that I sell in, um, sometimes I get a little ADD with, with my collecting and I really need to, yeah. kind of, especially when I'm collecting a million Cubs cards, um, it's a pretty large pursuit. So, um, trying to narrow the focus on that one collection. Um, but yeah, sometimes I'll see, you know, I, I follow David Peck on Twitter and all of the wrestling cards that he shows off. And it's just like, oh man, I, I need to, you know, pick up some of those. And it's like, nope focus 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 <laughs> oh you never know maybe you could do like you know one one thing maybe you get, end up narrowing down on like one really classic iconic card and you know you can put that on your display somewhere and then that's it you don't have to ever buy any more wrestling cards but you, you've got that that's... one <laughs> um so talking about wrestling cards um i know that you're really involved with the hobby and the sports end so i've anybody that's not like a diehard wrestling collector i always like to get their opinion on this We've seen Pokemon F1, all this other fringe stuff just kind of explode, like popularity, all, all, the dollar you know amount, of course, but just popularity, kids, adults, it doesn't matter. Well, why do you think wrestling cards is a global entertainment property, especially WWE? Uh, why do you think it's not like kind of caught on with the mainstream as far as putting it within those other fringe? Uh, a lot of popular platforms, we hear them talk about wrestling cards and they'll say, uh, oh, you know, the new new tops release is out, but let's let's move on to something else. Or, you know, this rock card sold for this amount, but let's go on to this other, you know, random prospect that sold. Why do you think it is that people aren't, I'm not going to say taking it serious because it's wrestling, but I guess just showing it the respect that it is within the hobby. You know, that's a great question. And I often wonder why, and it's always like, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, it's going to pop. Wrestling cards are going to pop. And when is it? When? You know, and I still think they will. And, you know, the, the biggest question that I ask is the same thing you asked is why has it not, especially during the peak we saw six months ago uh, with all, you know, you know, everything else blowing up and, and wrestling just never, you know, it, some attention, like you mentioned, but it just hasn't stuck and it hasn't. So I, I really don't know. I've, I've thought about that, you know, for the, the past year that it's like, when is when are we going to start seeing some mainstream attention to, to some of these bigger cards? And um, I don't know if it's, if it's because wrestling has been around, it's not like, you know, F1 is kind of this exotic, sexy sport sure. um, where it's, you know, all of a sudden it gets all this attention. Um, and, you know, I know it's been around too, but um, you know, pro wrestling hasn't, you know, hasn't really been mainstream since, you know, the late nineties with the, the attitude era mm -hmm. and it's all cyclical. I think with, um, with all of the, the new, I think, 
you know, the, the, the sale of WCW, you know, in 2001, I think that really kind of crushed the wrestling market um, because of no competition. Right. And I mean, for the last, up until recently, you know, for about a 20 year time span, WWE was the only thing. And yeah, you had some of the underground stuff, but you know, it just, it wasn't picking up that, you know, that fandom that we saw, you know, at the end of the territories and, you know, some of the, some of the independent scene in the, in the nineties with ECW, Smoky Mountain and, and Memphis. Um, but I think now with AEW and, and, and now with AEW having cards, I think upper deck, um, is bringing them on. Um, and you know, you're gaining steam from some of the other, you know, impact is, is picking sure. up steam and, you know, some of the others, maybe, you know, maybe we're still on the cusp and, I mean, I still think wrestling's going to pop. I still think we're going to see that um, that jump um, that we saw in some of the other fringe sports, you know, a few months ago. But when is it going to happen? Um, you know, I, I think I think it's bubbling. I think it's coming to a boil, and we're going to hit it eventually. But um, you know, when is the big question? You mentioned impact. Like that's, I think, the popularity of their product really uh, partially has been driven by the cards. Um, as, as weird as that sounds, um, they, I see a lot of people talking about the cards and the card releases online. And uh, I see a lot of people talking about the cards and the you know, limited release autograph sets that they're putting out. And I wonder if that's leading people to the product. Like you said, you know, I'm, it's interesting. It may be reverse engineering people to go watch wrestling. And something else I'll get your opinion on, and I ask this to everybody as well. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong. But for me, wrestling is something, and you said it with the magazines, You, no matter what period you watched, you end up being able to go back and rewatch that stuff, collect something that associates with that time. A lot of people in sports cards, I find, don't have that same connection. Maybe they're a player collector of somebody, you know, Michael Jordan or somebody like Kobe. I don't, those same people, I don't know of them actually going back and watching old games or old footage as much as wrestling fans do. So would you agree with that statement? I mean, you kind of said it with the magazines, but do you see the correlation I'm trying to draw there with the cards, with the nostalgia? Absolutely. Um, because I watch more classic content than what I watch, you know, new stuff. You know, sure. I, I, I've, WWE is, I've kind of been tuned out um, over the last couple of years. Um, I really like AEW, so I try to catch as much, as possible. And I like their YouTube shows because I can just watch it while I'm, you know, down here in the card room. Um, and, uh, but a lot of the stuff I, I consume, the content I consume is watching old Memphis uh, yeah. videos from the eighties and nineties and, you know, Smoky Mountain and, and the territory days, because I was, you know, basically my entire run of a, as being a wrestling fan from the late eighties all the way until recently has been, I was a WWE guy, WWF guy. And I paid no attention to the NWA. And so now listening to some of the podcasts and, you know, listening to the stories and in and, and those territory days, now I'm going back because there's some familiarity, gotcha. um, with, you know, listen to the, the Cornettes and the Shivani's and Jim Ross talk about some of those days and in those areas, those territories. Um, so now I'm going back and, and watching some of that stuff. So yeah, I, I consume more, you know, classic content, but as a, as a Cubs fan, very rarely do I go back and, you know, have a, have an eighties game on with Harry Carey announcing, right. um, you know, and if, if there's a, if there's a classic sports event, like ESPN used to have the classic sports mm -hmm. channel, you know, if, if there's an old game on, it's like, Oh, I've already seen that. But if there's an old wrestling, if I'm, I mean, I go to Peacock all the time and watch old pay-per-views. Um, so yeah, it's interesting that, yeah, you know, as, as wrestling fans, we go back and watch old stuff, but as sports fans, just don't do that the same way. Do you think because it is possibly more entertainment than legitimate sport, and maybe there's there's a there's a moment that like a build up and a lead up. Like I remember going back recently and starting watching the WCW Nitros from the minute Scott Hall walked down and the NWO started. I knew everything that's going to happen, but it was like the anticipation and build up to Hogan turning, and like I want I never get tired of watching it. So it's it's and, a, it's yeah. an interesting dynamic. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's more, you know, in wrestling and especially the, the programming from the early to mid eighties, you know, it became more entertainment. Um, mm -hmm. and, and obviously, you know, that they, 
you know, I had to change the well for other reasons, but they, you know, it's <laughs> WWE, right? World Wrestling Entertainment. Right. But, you know, it really did become entertainment in the, you know, in the mid 80s with their studio shows, Tuesday Night Titans and um, uh, the other show. And then they had uh, main event or, uh, yeah, Saturday Night Main Event. Yeah. So it became, and there was more, you know, there's the the backstage interviews and there was, you know, they, they really built the angles with, um, you know, you know, stories. There, there were stories behind the angles. It just wasn't two guys that are mad at each other going to wrestle there. You know, there's, there's a reason and, and there's a story to be told. And, and I think that's, you know, as wrestling fans, we enjoy following the stories and it's kind of like watching old TV shows. I mean, it's, right. it's kind of in the same vein where, you know, I watch Seinfeld over and over and over. I know exactly what's going to happen, but it's still entertaining. Yeah. And you said it characters, like it's really a character driven thing for me, characters and storylines. So then I automatically go to Pokemon collectors and I'm like, okay, you guys are into characters. Wrestling is the same thing. Why, you know, it goes back to the argument of why is this not appreciated? I don't care about, obviously we want our cards to go up in value, but like, I don't want people to understand it so I can sell them. I just want them to be respected. That's all. Um, Kind of moving around to the another topic that I'm a huge fan of your stuff on your content. Uh, you've you're really involved with buying and selling, and it's something I'm, I'm really passionate about. Especially being able to fund a PC, no matter what that is, by just you know being involved and not taking your life money and spending it on cardboard. So talk about first off, congratulations on being able to go full time into eBay and reselling, and just talk about that journey, how that's gone for you recently. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, I do a, a daily YouTube video, um, called hobby evolution in the mornings. And it started last July. Um, I was working from home at my day job and it was just kind of, you know, I just wanted to talk because now I'm, you know, mostly emailing and, mm -hmm. you know, it's, you know, my wife leaves for work and, um, I've got the dog, so I can talk to the dog, but you know, it's like, <laughs> I'm just going to talk to you know, talk to the camera and, you know, maybe people watch, maybe they don't. I just did it for myself and I continued doing it just to hear myself talk essentially. Never would I thought episode one last July that by episode 389 uh, that here I am doing this full time uh, selling cardboard. Um, and, you know, it, it's, you know, I've, I've, I've been on eBay since 1998 um, buying and selling you know, over the past 20 plus years, um, you know, and it was just casually and, you know, over the last seven years, since I really re-immersed myself in the, in the card hobby, um, you know, I, I was just doing it casually so I could buy more, you know, cards, right. try to make a profit on whatever I bought and, uh, and fund my Cubs collection or whatever collection before that I was working on. And then when I started the project, I had to spend so much money on postage doing trades where, yeah, I'm not wow. spending money on cards, but I'm trading cards and, you know, postage, you know, really adds up. So it's like, well, I need to sell some more just so I can pay for the postage for, for all of these trades. Um, and then it just kind of, it kind of blew up from there uh, with COVID hitting eBay exp expanded their free listings. Um, and, you know, you can see behind me, I have a lot of cards and it's like, well, I have time and now I have free listings on eBay. Let's, let's do it. And, um, the hobby blew up. So sales were, were humming along and, um, you know, every once in a while, my wife would ask me, well, do you think you can do this full time? Because I really didn't, I was in the transportation yeah. industry and it's, uh, it, it's stressful and it's, you know, it wasn't something that I, you know, wanted to, to do the rest of my life. I wanted to make a change at some point. And, uh, so I, just kind of tried to, you know, uh, cut as many costs overhead as I, as I could did a pretty good job doing that. And even though we've seen a dip over the last few months with, with sales in, in cards, it's still enough to, to be sustainable. Um, and over the summer, I really started crunching numbers, compared it to what I was making at my job. And, uh, on top of what I was making, okay, I can, you know, this is what I'm making plus my benefits at work. Here's what I'm making on the side. Can I make up that salary and those benefits if I devote 100% of my time to, to doing this? Um, and, you know, it was really an eye opening experience um, I'm sure. in, in crunching those numbers and realizing that not only do I think I can do it, I think I can, 
you know, make even more money than what I was making salary plus uh, side hustle. So, um, you know, this is, uh, as we talk, it's day, what, day three, um, being <laughs> full time in the hobby. And um, there's, you know, it's a lot of stress um, and there's a lot of fun. So looking forward to, to many more days. Yeah, a lot to go over there that I want to break down for people. Uh, first off, I think we're going to be in agreements on this. Would you agree that eBay is probably just by far the best platform for reselling? I have personally tried, you know, a lot of the newer card stuff. Um, you know, I still use ComC and Starstock. Uh, Sport Lots is there, but I don't use it anymore. I've heard you talk about that also. Um, would you just, I mean, to me, eBay is it? eBay is, yeah, by far. And, and now that I'm doing this, uh, you know, full-time as a business, even more so based on, you know, uh, expense tracking, tax purposes and right. all that. Um, I mean, people complain about the fees. I think the fees are, you know, very fair. Um, right. I would, I, I mean, really it's, it's kind of, um, it, it, they could raise them a little bit more. And I know people are curse well, me for saying that. Sorry to interrupt, but, but I got to say it. Would you just say, this is what I tell people. It's a cost of doing business. And I think exactly. there's a lot of people out there that don't understand business. Right. And yeah, I think that's, that's a big part of it. And I mean, look at the eyeballs and I know a lot of people complain, well, I can, I can, I can sell on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and there's no fees, but you know, what if you have 500 followers? Um, you've got 500 sets of eyeballs and they, they have to see it at the right time. Right. And it's, it's not as easy as going to a search bar and searching, I want this card and finding your for sale post from whatever day it, it could have been where, you know, eBay's a storefront and, um, and just the, the CRM aspect alone yeah. um, for anybody that's, that's been in sales. I mean, those are expensive. And I mean, eBay has, you know, everything's right there. It's, it's so easy to maintain and, and track your sales, uh, you know, keep, uh, keep all of the information. Um, and then, you know, now that, that I'm doing this as a business with, you know, uh, sales tax and all that, eBay collects all that for you and you just print a report out and, and that's it. Um, so it, it's just, and I mean, the sets of eyeballs alone is, yeah. is well worth the, you know, the overhead and in, in the fees that, that, uh, get eaten up. So when you decided you're going to do this full-time, not as in full-time side hustle, as in full-time make a living. Um, and I don't want you to give away your secrets if this, if this is kind of opening that up. But um, I think most people think you're one of those like, you know, PSA backwards hat wearing dudes. Now you got to be flipping <laughs> thousands of dollars worth of cards in your backpack. But um, are you mainly doing just like low dollar, high volume, or is it kind of a mix of the high end and the $1 cards? Where are you at it on that? it's like mostly low end. Um, you know, I'm, I'm the guy that you, you see at the card show sitting in a chair, digging through a bargain box for three hours. Um, and, and I just try to turn 25 cents into $5. And, and I've had, you know, several successes here recently in the last few months where I've found, uh, I've found a Ronald Acuna, um, short print out of gypsy queen in the 25 cent box. And I didn't even know it was a short print. I yeah. just knew it was a Cunha. Right. And hey, I can probably <laughs> sell this for a dollar. And I can get it for 20 cents because I'm buying bulk. I'm buying 100 of these cards. Um, when I started sorting through, I see, well, I pulled out another Gypsy Queen. It looks different. Look it up. And I sell it for 30 bucks. And it came out of a 25 cent box. So um, a lot of times I know what I'm looking for. Sometimes I just get lucky. Um, that happened to uh, uh, Mike Trout as well that, ended up selling for like 30 or $40. Um, so there's, there's, there's money to be made in those bargain boxes. So that's kind of, um, how I go about it. I buy bulk. Um, I'll buy some bulk deals. I run a card show with, and I have basically all 25 cent boxes and people are probably thinking, well, if you're the bargain box guy as a buyer, I'm not going to look at your bargain boxes, but you know, that's, it's kind of the opposite where I, you know, I sneak in some, you know, some five, $10, you're not going to find a $20 card, more than likely in my bargain boxes, but you're going to find some five, $10 cards in there. Um, and it's all about the hunt. So, um, I do rip some wax. So, you know, sometimes I'll have a, you know, a big autograph that, that I put on eBay, but sure. I, I've never submitted uh, a card for grading. Um, I do want to submit some of my Cubs collection, uh, just basically for authentication purposes for some of my pre-war cards, um, that are raw. Um, but yeah, I'm not, 
you know, I'm not at, at those tables flipping high end slabs or anything like that. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hustling for uh, volume and, and low dollar flips. Yeah. And um, correct your, most of your stuff you're actually selling, whether it's eBay or at the stores, it's all raw, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have, you know, if the only slabs that I have are is if I, you know, pick them up, you know, if I, if I see, I, I bought some basketball rookies at the national uh, that were SGC slabs. Um, so I, I, I put one on eBay. It was a $12 buy at the national and, and I sold it last week for 50. Um, you know, so it's, it's not high end stuff. It's, you know, kind of lower, lower range. Um, but I've got, you know, some of those slabs where if I can find a, a good bulk deal, um, I'll buy those, but I typically stay away because it's, it's just not, you know, I always preach, pick your lane, find mm -hmm. a niche and pick your lane. Um, and you know, I'm not going to rule out in the future if I'm you know going to do that, but right now I'm having success with the low end high volume and, uh, I'm going to stick to, to what I know and, and stay in my lane. So something else that actually a good point that I'd like to get your opinion on. I've, I've said this to a lot of people when, when you're talking about buying bulk, it just kind of came into my head there. Um, I will literally buy anything if like, it's a math game to me. So I don't care if it's non-sports cards, if it's modern sports, vintage sports, junk wax era. I, I mean, I am still, I don't know about you, but I can still sell junk wax era cards for, you know, 99 cents with free shipping or 99 cents with a little bit of shipping on my eBay store. So, um, is that how you're kind of looking at these bulk deals from just a math perspective? Or are you more so looking for what you know specific types of cards will sell for? Uh, usually, so my my approach is um, two weeks ago, I was at a show and I bought a, a dollar box um, outright. And as I was, you know, kind of my my plan is first, I, I feel out the vendor and, and the vendor I had already done, I had bought, he had uh, sold a box to me at a, a good price. So I knew that he was probably looking to, to move in bulk. Um, so I just kind of look, he had like $4, you know, four separate dollar boxes. And I kind of went through um, and first kind of judge, is this worth buying in bulk? You know, gotcha. if it's a lot of, you know, even though I can sell some junk wax stuff, you know, for 99 cents, um, I don't want to be overloaded with it um, because sometimes it does take time to move. Um mm -hmm. So if it's newer stuff, you know, I kind of take a look and uh, this particular box had some, you know, trout inserts or um, there was a Glaber Torres short print um, and it was a, a nice mix of football and basketball and baseball. Um, so I kind of take a look to see, OK, what's the content first? Um, and if it's something I know I can I can move quickly, then we start talking uh, price. And, you know, I threw out an offer, which was about 10 cents per card. Um, and he accepted that. And so at 10 cents a card, because a lot, about half the box, uh, is probably in the 25 cent box where I can throw it on eBay for 99 cents or a dollar 25, but my profit is going to end up being, you know, 20 cents. Right. Um, so I can just put those in a penny sleeve and, uh, put those in my own 25 cent box. And, you know, maybe down the road when I, if I need inventory for my eBay store, I can, you know, put those for a dollar in the, in the eBay store. So that was kind of the approach where I, I checked to make sure what con if the content I can move, um, and then come on a price where, you know, even though I'm putting half the box in a 25 cent box, you know, I'm paying 10 cents a card. So it's, uh, you know, there's still profit to be made and, you know, like the Glaber, the, the Glaber Torres in there sold for seven or eight bucks and sure. some other card sold for three or four. So, um, so in the end, that's kind of how I look at, at the bulk buys. I, I think, you know, we're kind of on the same page as far as like the, the lower end sales and people just don't understand that if you move this stuff in volume, like it adds up. So um, I'm sure you've heard the complaints. I know I have. What would you say to somebody that is either looking to fund a PC, looking to do this for a living? Like what, what would you have to say to them to get over that hurdle of starting the just reselling perspective, whether it's eBay or at a show in person? Um, usually I would, you know, you know, I, I read a lot, it kind of like in my, as I was making this transition and, and thinking about this transition, I, I kept seeing, you know, on LinkedIn, I was, you know, reading the, you know, some of these articles and it was like, just start, just start. Yes. Um, but I would also say, uh, find 
find a specialty um, and, and test it out to make sure it works. Um, you know, sometimes if, it, you know, and I'll go with the, car, the card show angle, um, you know, if you set up at a card show, you know, remember the costs involved in, in just setting up a, a table and, you know, any other expenses that if you have to travel um, and all that, um, you know, you know, where's your pricing at? And, you know, I would just say do a card show um, and, and try it out. Sometimes, you know, it kind of depends on, on the show. Is it promoted well? Is, you know, the right audience there for, for what you're looking for? And sometimes it may take a couple tries, but um, from that vantage point, I would say, just, just go ahead and do it. When it comes to eBay, just try to, there's so many ways to, uh, to um, cut your overhead costs. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes as simple as, um, you know, using the, the eBay shipping, don't go to the post office. I actually, I shipped some stuff for my wife and I used pirate ship this morning. Oh and, yeah. You know, the retail was going to be like $5 and 25 cents. And, you know, just using pirate ship or those, you know, discount, uh, PayPal shipping, you know, it's like $3 and 40 cents. Um, I use label printers, which saves a ton of money on ink. Um, and, and, um, you know, some of my, my 99 cent, I keep the cost down. I have, uh, pre-stamped envelopes that I buy. Yep. You can buy rolls of forever stamps. That's what I do um, for about 40 cents, I think a piece. And, um, so that keeps those costs down. So, um, there's a lot of ways, there's a lot of tricks to, um, to, you know, help save money and, and save time. Uh, last thing we'll talk about today is your content. We touched a little bit on it earlier. Uh, ever since I started doing this, which the whole reason I did is because nobody was talking about wrestling cards or kind of, you know, fringe stuff within the hobby. So I was like, Hey, what you just said, I'm just going to start. And here we are. So what have you found uh, from producing content as far as like the audience, audience engagement to me for do, like doing this right here, it's become a hobby within a hobby. Are you seeing that also, or are you networking? Like, are you getting really good deals from networking from other collectors? Like just talk about your experience of producing content so far. Yeah, a little, uh, you know, kind of all of the above. Um, you know, when I first started, uh, actually, <laughs> the funny thing, one of the biggest tips I got from YouTube is by, uh, from a good friend of mine, uh, growing up, we've known each other since preschool, and he's like the exact opposite of me, where he hates social media, oh, and okay. he hates content production, and uh, he's a financial planner, and uh, he signed up with an agency to, to help him produce some content. And now all of a sudden he's learning, you know, some of the, the tricks to YouTube. And we were actually, we were going to a Cubs game this summer and we were on the train and he's given me these tips on, on YouTube. And it's like, wow, like creating a thumbnail. And yeah, it's like, wow, this is, you know, who would have thought, you know, six months ago, he's, you know, telling me that he's nervous about doing YouTube. And he's like, how do you just turn the camera on and talk for a half an hour? And now he's, turning around and giving me advice, yep. um, on YouTube. And so it's, it's some of those things. And, you know, now I actually have fun, uh, trying to come up with thumbnails. Um, and, and my wife turned me on to Canva and yep. there's a, a YouTube thumbnail on Canva. And I just try to, you know, incorporate what I'm going to talk about into, uh, into a YouTube thumbnail. So, you know, it's kind of expanded my horizons with, uh, you know, some of that stuff and the relationships too are huge. Um, you know, I can, I can reach out yesterday. I, I tweeted out, you know, I'm looking for somebody to help me with my website, redesign my website. Yep. I, you know, I, I know how to create the posts and do, you know, the, the bare minimum. Um, but I want to change the whole theme of the website. And so somebody reached out that was following me on Twitter and, um, we had a, a chat on the phone yesterday. And so he's going to, going to help me out with the website. And, um, so just, you know, meeting people and, and, and developing those relationships is, has been, you know, more fun than, than what the cards have been. Yeah. And, um, do you also consume like all different types of content? Because I've also found that helps me with doing the videos, like watching stuff outside of the hobby, but you can still take bits and pieces of stuff to kind of put into the hobby and make it a little bit more entertaining with people. Absolutely. Um, I listen to some like marketing podcasts, um, and, and sometimes it helps with, you know, not just, uh, some of my own content to tie it into cards and the hobby, but, um, also with like Facebook advertisements and, um, uh, I promote a card show in Madison, Wisconsin, and we started using Facebook ads 
to promote back in like May or June. And we thought we were getting good results. And then all of a sudden I, you know, uh, listened to this podcast and it's like, okay, you know, here's some, some tips on, you know, really hitting those algorithms and, and making it work. And once I applied that, it was like the, the results were like two times, you know, we got two, two X the value out of that month's ad uh, just by tweaking some of the things within, within the ad. So, you know, just listening to some of those things helps um, not only my own content, but, you know, you know, just assisting the business side as well. Um, I know you only collect the Cubs cards mainly, but is there any, I'm, I'm not telling you to name names, but do you watch other hobby content and does that help you? Because I find that even though I'm not collecting modern basketball or baseball or whatever, watching a lot of straight up sports card content has actually helped me with wrestling or helped me with being able to buy and sell stuff, just kind of understanding what's going on. Does, is that uh, something for you as well? Absolutely. Especially when, when I'm, you know, looking for, for bargain box flips and um, just, you know, keeping an, an eye on things. And, and I watch, I started watching following basketball a little bit more the NBA last year because of cards. Sure. Um, and, you know, I had bought some low end rookie card, you know, some of the, the, the second, third tier rookie cards. And, you know, maybe one of these guys goes off for a 40 point game and, and blows up. So, you know, consuming some of the, uh, you know, some of the other podcasts within the hobby, you know, really turns me on to, okay, well, you know, football card, this is hot in football cards and I follow football. Um, but, you know, from a hobby standpoint, you know, some of the superstars um, on the field are not superstars within the hobby. And, Correct. and I know that all too well with baseball, but uh, you know, kind of seeing that in, in football and in basketball and some of the other sports as well. So it, it kind of, yeah, it, it definitely helps, you know, understand what, you know, what's hot and what could be hot. Sure. Well, thanks for coming on today. Appreciate all the great information. Let everybody know where they can find you, where they can keep up with your content and where they can keep up with the 1 million Cubs project. Absolutely. Uh, my website, 1 million cubs.com. And that uh, is kind of a one stop that'll point you in all directions. Um, I spend most of my social media time on Twitter. Uh, my, my Twitter handle is at 1 million cubs. Um, on Facebook, the 1 million Cubs project, uh, Instagram is 1 million Cubs. And, uh, I think that's about it. 1 million Cubs.com. We'll, we'll get you there. Uh, my YouTube channel as well. 1 million Cubs project. Um, so that's, I believe you, you also have an address on your website. Don't you, where people can just send you Cubs cards, like no trading, just here you go. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yep. Uh, uh, PO box six, two, eight, four, five, six, uh, Middleton, Wisconsin, um, and, and again, that, uh, that's there on the website as well. 1 million cubs.com. So everybody watching, if you've got cubs cards and you don't want them, regardless of what they are, if you're, if you're still saying eBay fees are too high and you don't want to sell them on eBay, <laughs> send them to Bo guys. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you later. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you learned a lot as always, when I'm doing these videos, I have the collector or the person who's trying to color up in their collection or make some money in mind when I'm talking to guests who know what they're doing. Whether that's like Bo and he's now doing it for a living, he gets it. Or whether that's somebody like Rob England, David Peck, Tony Vela, Paul and Ann, Chuckster, somebody who's been in the wrestling card game for so long, they know practically everything. All of this content is produced because I want to just get the word out there about wrestling cards, entertain you guys, and just continue to, you know, spread awareness, get people involved, have fun, and just realize that wrestling cards are fun and there's different ways you can do it. And I'm trying to bring in different guests and different aspects of the hobby so I can just prove a point that yes if you do want to play or collect go for it if you just want to flip you can do that too if you just want to buy sets and never sell anything you can do that too that's what all of the information and content that I produce is all about again before you head out of here make sure you click the show notes below for links to everything I'm involved with the podcast patreon Spotify, social platforms, you name it, it's probably down there. While you're down there, make sure you give Bo a follow on Twitter. Great guy. And we want to thank him again for giving us his time, now that this is all he's doing for a living. He took time out of his busy day to talk with me and share information with you guys. Also, make sure to subscribe to his YouTube channel. Like I said, a lot of great content. You don't have to collect baseball cards to be able to consume ideas and great content and learn. And then, like I said, apply it to wrestling or apply it to whatever you're collecting if you're watching this. While you're subscribing to Bo's channel, hit the subscribe button right now on my channel. It's the easiest way that you can help support my content. Thank you all for watching. But before you go, click the videos on the screen right now. There they are, right now. Go ahead, click. For more great wrestling card content and more great guests, 
and more great entertainment. Until next time, see you wrestling fans.